That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Desire Lines, which I believe is the third feature length project from director Jules Roscombe, which premieres in the next program at the 2024 Sundance Film Festival on January 22nd, 2024. Do you know Jules' other work? Uh, no, but of the feature length documentary items, thick relations and paternal rights do sound interesting to me. This is a docu-hybrid. Mm -hmm. What is it about? An Iranian-American trans man travels back in time to an LGBTQ plus archive to understand his sexuality. He encounters his past and present selves during an erotic journey of self-discovery. What's your pull quote? An intriguing premise and an ambitious approach aren't quite matched by an incohesive presentation in this ambiguous exploration of erotically uh, inclined portraits of trans experiences and trans histories. Mine. Desire Lines is most effective when focusing on individuals sharing their unique experiences. Unfortunately, a messy structure, cumbersome stylistic choices, and amateurish acting make this hybrid documentary less than satisfying. Unfortunately, I'm, I have to agree. I'm but, sorry. <laughs> but, I, I, again, though, I think, you know, just reading uh, what it's, aiming for is, uh, should spark your intrigue. And there are several things I learned in this that I think make it worthwhile. It's just that upon learning about those things, I wanted it to be so much more. So there are three sort of, I feel like there are three projects sort of crammed into this 80 minute docu-hybrid. So one is that we're introduced to a trans man, a real life man named Lou Sullivan. Mm -hmm. who died from complications from AIDS in the 90s. But we have access to some video interviews he did back in the day. Archival so, footage. Archival footage. So we get that. Then we get, when I read the premise, the Iranian gentleman. He is working in like, a, like an archive center, which apparently is like in his mind. But then within that, he's also traveling to other places as he looks through the archives. And this man is paired with his co-worker, played by... Theo Germain, playing Kiernan. And the Iranian-American is Ahmad, played by Aidan Hakimi. And we know Theo from They Slash Them. Yes. So there's that storyline. And then a third sort of aspect is the true documentary portion, where we have trans men being interviewed about an array of topics. Mostly sexual. Mm -hmm. And then within that, there is this sort of... Uh, and, and notably, I think, a trans-masculine perspective. Sure. So within these people, then we get these like little vignettes of two men almost like acting out like they're on Grindr, mm -hmm. messaging each other. So they're reading the lines. And then after they read the lines, they sort of unpack them. So there's a lot going on. Unpack them in a way that seems like these two... Uh, have never met. Have never met. Have not discussed what they were going to talk about. <laughs> and it's, a, it's usually a trans-masculine person. The, the two instances that I'm recalling are a trans-masculine person and a cis queer black man. So, which I thought was interesting <clears throat> that both of them have that same pairing. Yeah. So I, while I didn't care for this, it did inspire me to think like I would love to make a documentary about an aspect of this docu-hybrid because there's so much about it that I found interesting to start off so the the film opens with a quote from Lou Sullivan our best weapon in coping with our situation is our imagination and then we meet Lou and you were reading about him outside of the film mm -hmm. and he's had quite the life fascinating and fascinating I think, so then I wish like oh I, you could just have a documentary about him well, both because in 2019, they published uh, a series of Lou's letters in which they documented, you know, a lot of their sexual experiences and uh, feelings uh, across a wide array of subjects. But it's called We Both Laughed in Pleasure. And that is something I can't wait to read. But it made me think of a recent documentary called Mutzenbacher, uh, which was simply these men reading from this erotically charged text. And that, would, that was... Uh, cis hetero men in that documentary but what i couldn't help but think like what if we just had uh trans men reading from lou's passages and yeah. reacting to what they said I, which I, kind of sounds like a documentary we watched a docu-hybrid from the 2022 sundance film festival 
Do you recall the name? I'm forgetting the title of that. I'm going to flash it right yeah. now. But, but that had a lot of reenactments. Similar to this, kind of, but they were reading sort of like the, 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 the one I'm referring to, they, these documentarians had access to psychiatric files. Yes. Of and they trans were, people. With some stuff that was redacted. Yes. So I thought Lou Sullivan himself was so fascinating. And the one thing we learned about him from this documentary is that the, the difficulties he experienced attempting to transition female to male, but also identifying as gay. Because, of course, at that time in the early 80s, it was like, well, if you want to have sex with men, then you should just remain a woman. And, of course, that's not how... Like, his sexuality and his gender are two different things. So I thought that was immensely fascinating. We could have just spent an entire documentary on that. Well, in Lou Sullivan's crusade, too, because they were denied sex reassignment surgery because of their sexual orientation. Uh, and afterwards, pursuing the removal of homosexuality from contraindications that would allow someone to receive SRS. Then he says something at the end that was extremely powerful relating to how he wasn't effectively like like seen as a gay man, but he's going to die like one because he died. I, I have the exact. Quote. Yeah, read the exact quote. I took a certain pleasure in informing the gender clinic that even though the program told me I could not live as a gay man, it looks like I'm going to die like one. Of course. I mean, that like took my breath away. Right. Okay. So then that sort of relates to the documentary portion, talking to actual trans men and them talking about their experiences. And I thought that was the best part of this film. And then when they talk about how they, these trans men in modern day, are relating to gay men in gay culture and how they really feel like they're like newbies. Mm -hmm. And so their vulnerabilities are fully exposed because one gentleman talks about how like a lot of trans men are treated like lesbians. So like HIV awareness is minimal. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them are more exposed. And while we do mention that, I thought that could be an entire documentary. But the weakest part of this film is the storyline, the the sort of dramatization of Ahmad. The it it can't quite sell the loftiness of it and so it ends up detracting from what's going on. Even though within those exchanges there's are some interesting elements. I think um Theo Germain is quoting Jacques Derrida talking about the notion of archival fever and our obsession with kind of having to go back to uh as he says possess the, a moment of origin and where that is for trans history. Uh, th th that is a fascinating element. It's just that in this sterile office environment with these two people going through clunky dialogue, it doesn't work. Yeah, the production design is not the best. I think the acting is really stiff. The dialogue is, is not fluid. It, it just feels very awkward. And then to understand that like, we're in someone's imagination who within that is also traveling to other places, namely a sex club. And I thought the sex club was handled in a way that felt very clunky and mm -hmm. sterile. And so unfortunately that did not work for me at all. I also didn't understand the archive center. That time period is sent right, uh, set right before the pandemic starts. So it's like March, 2020. So I assume... Does it explicitly say that? Because I wasn't sure. It, it, well, it's pandemic well, related, but I'm not right. sure. I'm not sure where, because there, again, there are contradictions of them going to Steamworks in Chicago right before the pandemic or during the pandemic. I assumed it was March 2020 because they talk about coronavirus twice and we see Theo's character, K Kiernan, mm -hmm print out a sign that says we're going to be closed due to coronavirus. And then he says, oh, we're only going to be closed for two weeks. Which, sure. which makes me sure. think that, oh, that's when we didn't realize that this shit was like real serious. So initially I thought, was this filmed in 2020? And I they, don't think so. But then it's like, okay, if it was filmed in 2023, why would you set it at the beginning of the pandemic except to try to parallel it with the HIV epidemic? And, but then it doesn't really... And Ahmad is reading a pamphlet about surviving a pandemic. So I, I think those are parallels that we're supposed to be drawing. It's just that I, I don't know how successful 
It no, is right. Brutal. Then the documentary portion where we get the sort of reenactments of grinder messages, you said something that I thought was good is that it felt like a BuzzFeed video. Yeah. But like a really crunchy BuzzFeed video. Like even like the shooting of it, like the the, the actors are not, or the subjects are not centered. And then when one's talking, the other one is sort of awkwardly. It's just edited in a really odd way that if it's by choice to show the awkwardness between the two, I don't know that I thought that was effective. I just felt uncomfortable in a way that didn't relate to the subject matter. I agree. Uh, and it's funny because there, again, there were conversations happening that I think are interesting and yes. important, but also how much more fascinating would have been for these trans men that are having sex with cis gay men to also hear some counter, not arguments, but that in particular, the, the thing that pops out in my head is there's one subject that's asked if they can identify for us what the difference is between fetishization and desire. And they give an answer that makes sense to them. But it's also like, this also sounds like somebody that is wholly new to uh, the cruising queer community in 2023 and about how th that's just how it is. And that differentiation, what this person thought notated somebody's desire is actually uh, could also be an earmarker for predatory behavior as in they know all the things that they say to you to get what they want from you but it's just in, there's no counter so right and i thought i mean that's kind of the documentary i would like to make is having that counter so having the trans men with the gay cis men and sort of flushing out these feelings and and while this documentary does approach those topics it just kind of leaves it hanging and then something i didn't mention that i really didn't like is these three different components are kind of brought together by this effect where we so on the screen as we're watching the, the film it looks like we're looking at someone's desktop and then we see them looking at different folders putting them in digital files putting them in files and they it takes kind of an uncomfortable uncomfortably long time for anybody, to get from one to the other for anybody who's ever done a grad school project you might be triggered <laughs> yeah that. it was and i don't know what it's adding it just feels like dead screen time and i get wanting to play with different visual textures to kind of break things up because again uh, the other thing is people are going to say how boring it is if it was just talking head figures right that's always a critique that a lot of documentarians face but I don't know. And sometimes that classic format is sometimes more effective. Well, that's my next note. It's like, you know, we always say show, don't tell. But in this instance, I think you could tell and not show. We didn't need to see a reenactment of a bathhouse. I, I, I was most captivated listening to the trans men talk about their sexual experiences. You know, we could have used way more of that. Well, and then this whole thing with Kieran and Ahmad, who were also led to believe are kind of sharing a flirtation with one another. <laughs> That's my next note because I thought Kieran was uh, both of them are so unprofessional. Like, yeah, because Kieran's making sexual comments. I just thought it was funny because you would think that demographic would be the most sensitive sure. to having appropriate professional boundaries, and Theo's character in particular just seems really unaware of his behavior and how it's inappropriate. Like, we're gonna go to Steamworks, but that also is something that uh, a young person a boundary they would also probably willingly cross. Another topic the film brings up that I thought was really interesting is this idea of the what came first, the chicken or the egg, talking about, like, were you trans first or were you gay first? Mm -hmm. and how they... I, I would have loved to hear more about that. I would have loved to hear more... You already alluded to it, but some of the trans men talking about, like, using apps, like sex apps, to find sexual partners and how some of them say that they feel like they need people to be more concerned about them in order to feel se sexual in that way. And it's like, well, that you're, you're kind of playing in the wrong pool then sometimes. And like, I, like, I just wanted more of a discussion of that, like someone to counter, maybe have like a, a clinician, like a mental health professional talking about the dangers in, engaging well, in these behaviors and not being aware of certain things. Well, and in even a broader scope is what we've condoned as normalized in the LGBTQ plus community uh, as far as um, non-consensual, or non-consensual, uh, no strings attached sexual encounters go. 
Then going back to the dramatization, Theo's character has like an STI scare that I thought was handled very strangely. I under I took it as sort of trying to parallel some of the trans men who are actually speaking in the documentary part, saying that their community feels more at risk because no one uh, directs marketing to them trying to explain their sexual health. So it makes sense to me why Theo's character would have an STI scare, but again, the way it's handled felt very like well clunky. Right? Because one, um, Kieran's phone is ringing at their desk, and so they have to run in because it causes disruption, and then is, is making a big show of taking this phone call, and then goes down the hallway and talks very loudly. And then know. says, I, I can't talk, I'm at work. And then, yeah, I just thought that was handled very strangely. The final moment of the film is that Kieran's, is it Kieran or Kieran? I wrote down Kieran. Theo's character has mentioned to Ahmad more than once about going to a bathhouse and how he should go. And then finally, the final scene is Ahmad in his mind going to a bathhouse. And I, one funny moment is we see a bucket of water being filled from like the ceiling leaking. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know what that was meant to represent because we see it twice. But we also see it as they're exiting the building to go on this two-week coronavirus vacation. And the bucket's almost full. And I thought, y'all just gonna let this bucket run over with water. <laughs> but yeah, the final scene is Ahmad at the bathhouse, which like you already alluded to, seemed like odd timing, considering that everything's shutting down for the pandemic. I don't, but I guess it's, if it's in his mind, I don't know. I don't know if this, that's supposed to be a metaphor for the, this archive where we're told several times that this is the last resting place for some of this material, which would likely be destroyed and there, there are leaks springing everywhere and we're going to lose this history. Oh, we didn't even talk about that because Theo's character at one point says, oh, all these images in the archive just sit here. So I've been taking them home and publishing them online on my own, which is like, that is so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand some of the choices for this dramatization. I feel like I'm just shitting on this docu-hybrid. I was excited to watch it. I think it's important. I think the subject matter and the subjects are important and I would love to see more. I just don't think this was a well I was excited. done effort. I was uh, curious to see Jennifer Reeder as uh, one of the executive producers on this. but uh, And also throughout we get snippets of Sylvester's You Make Me Feel. And then at the very end, in the final fantasy bathhouse sequence with the mod, they have Dorian Wood doing a Sylvester, a, like a croony cover. cover of the Sylvester song. Which was cool. Rest in peace to Sylvester. What would you give Desire Lines? I think it's a decent conversation starter, uh, but <laughs> I, it, it, I would it, give it two out of five. I would give it two out of five as well. <laughs> it, it just doesn't succeed Sorry. enough for me. Anything else? No. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye.